Welcome to Making Conversations, a podcast from makers Gemma Millen and Robin Galway. Today we are making conversations with ceramicist Anne Butler. Hi and welcome to our 10th episode of our second series. We are talking to Anne Butler today, who is an amazing ceramicist. So welcome, Anne. Hi. Yes, hello, and thank you very much for inviting me to have a chat with you today. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. And could you tell us a wee bit about yourself? What about your childhood? Did you come from a particularly creative family or how did you get into ceramics? I was born just outside Cambridge on a farm within close family you know there's not too many people working within the creative industries but my grandmother made cakes and I would have spent a lot of time with her watching her roll the toffee and pour the fudge and make Sounds delicious. And the decorations I mean she made an awful lot of wedding cakes so there was a lot of icing there's many times when I'm making that I actually that resonates that I think oh yes this is a very very similar technique or when you're trying to come up with a way of making and in the archives of your head somewhere you can remember seeing my grandmother make certain things and think oh that's not too dissimilar in its technique albeit a different medium myself I always drew I love drawing initially it was a lot with cartoon characters and things and then I was at the sewing machine I just sewed an awful lot I'd make a lot of my soft toys and I suppose looking back at it I would make a lot of the patterns for them now I didn't know that this was slightly unusual (laughs) and if I look back and think at the age of eight and nine that I was making quite complex I suppose soft toys which are 3D just freehand cutting those out from scrap bits of material lying about then I mean I can't say they were great but when I look back at them I think well no that was quite an achievement for that age (laughs) so there must have been some aspect in me that liked that aspect of 3D or engineering problem solving (laughs) but no there was nobody else in the extended family that enjoyed the creative industries or drew or painted so I'm not sure where that came from really other than my grandmother who loved making cakes even as you're saying that about piecing together little scraps to make toys and knowing how you make pieces by piecing pieces of porcelain together Mm. that's such a lovely little connection there about how you already you know as a child were just putting together these processes that have now maybe subconsciously made its way into your actual making practice absolutely I mean if you look at my bowls they are very much um, deconstructed and then constructed and you are fundamentally making patterns pattern making and having to very quickly cut a piece that you know is going to fit in from a 2d piece cutting it that it would fit into a three-dimensional mold it perhaps is something that's just innate or or something that uh, by making all those patterns when I was younger was just something that I developed there's also such a, an icing quality to it as well. Like whenever you described your grandmother making these sheets of icing, like that is actually how I would imagine you work. The translucency through your work as well has that sort of very sweet, feminine, delicateness to it, mm-hmm. um, which is beautiful. Although um, n- not quite the same taste. I'm sure probably not. <laughs> but no, still yeah. It. But there are, I f- my technique let's say I mean because there's a very I have a whole palette of techniques that I use but say specifically with the bowls where I'm working on that translucency and the thinness of a piece of material to enable me to get that I'm pouring it and smoothing it very thinly over a plaster bat that absolutely has resonance to my grandmother smoothing candy (laughs) Uh, thinly over her workbenches enough to be able to peel that off absolutely there are analogies to both of those and they're, they're very 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 closely linked do you bake now or have, do you bake no, cakes? no anybody who knows me <laughs> <laughs> it's just not in my repertoire <laughs> has there been times in my past yes when I have had a large kitchen or somewhere that I have felt that was conducive to making or baking but no I I don't have a a culinary bone in my body um, <laughs> no basic cooking mm too busy cooking beautiful things in big ceramic ovens that's what it is maybe that's where my creative outlet is I mean I have lived in Japan and there I spent you know it was very interesting learning Mm -hmm. 
not baking necessarily, but cooking with local mm -hmm. things you found in the um, supermarket and uh, and the same in Indonesia. But it's not something that I spend a lot of time on. Were you very good at art in school then as a subject? Was that something that you really excelled in? Not excelled as such, but it was something that I was probably the main area that I got the most enjoyment out of or had a feeling that I was succeeding at. I have a bit of dyslexia there and that probably impacted on a lot of the learning prior to actually ever being really diagnosed. But I think that impacted perhaps on how much you were achieving in other areas. And I think like everybody that getting praise for a certain subject promotes you and just makes you feel that you want to try a bit harder at it, you know. So it's chicken egg situation. I don't know. Perhaps there was a an innate ability there that just got honed and developed or whether it was from a situation where it was the one area that you were getting encouragement for. As a child then, what did you want to be when you were an adult? Oh, I can't remember. It wasn't ceramic then or ceramic artist. <laughs> no, no, no. There was an element of enjoying geography and anatomy and art. I would imagine they're three main subjects, I think. Geography and geology, that would still continue. I think there is a fascination in that, perhaps. You know, I sometimes look at people where they, they have that clear idea from a very young age as to what they want to be or what they're aiming towards. I can't say that was ever part of <laughs> who I was there was lots of things like travel and exploring and lots of other things that I wanted to do before I would think about the area that I specifically wanted to work in. And so how did ceramics first appear to you to become an option with travel especially as well being from Cambridge you're now based in Northern Ireland how did all of that come about? I arrived in Armagh as a teenager and had the opportunity of going to Newry and Mooncraft where I was able to put a portfolio together. I applied to the art college and was fortunate enough to get entry to the art college. So I moved to Belfast and yeah, went into ceramics. And did you do a foundation course beforehand no. or did you know that ceramics was where your, your heart was? I think there was an affinity with the material having worked in Newry and Mooncraft. I think there was with print, but specifically ceramics. Again, I was dealing with some very, very, very thin, thin sheets of porcelain and pattern. So I think I had an affinity with the material. I had never really worked with ceramics before. Yes, obviously had enough work getting direct entry. And working with porcelain straight away as well, a lot of people tend to steer clear from that for quite a while, just because it can be a bit of a difficult material. But you were straight in there then with working with porcelain. Yes, it's always interesting looking back that you realise that from the very onset of when you were working with, well, it, it, I don't think it would matter too much whether it was painting or textiles or ceramics in that case, that I was pretty much doing the same sort of thing <laughs> in some ways. There was a construction, deconstruction and work a lot with slabs. And it wasn't all, no, it wasn't all porcelain. I mean, I, I, I made lots of things out of stoneware as well, but I do remember some pieces taking them to my interview and, and all those were porcelain and coloured porcelain. And then I got into the art college and had the three years there. And do you think you've got a strong aesthetic to your work? Is it pretty consistent from right through to now? Or your earlier work would be quite unrecognisable? I think my early work, there would still be things that come through, some shapes, some techniques. Though that palette has widened and developed, there would be some fundamental interests, I think, that run through. When have you first went to the art college? What kind of things were you making? Because you had come in with this quite strong aesthetic already, were you aiming to go somewhere with your education or was it developing the aesthetic that you already had? Like, what was it you were kind of craving from that experience? I, I think art college is segmented into lots of different uh, projects. So I think there were those projects that I enjoyed and or those that, you know, was all about the assessment at the end of it and it wasn't necessarily it was something that you enjoyed doing necessarily it wasn't really until the third year and then I was wheel based I was on the wheel I used a black I don't think it was a black porcelain but it was a black clay and I threw and cut and reassembled with a very strong influence from Hans Coper and Lucy Ree at that point but I would see some very similar shapes coming into my work now I was also um, very interested in Minoan Crete and again that archaeology and history that has really come through a lot has remained in a lot of my work and interests. 
It's quite surprising about throwing as well. Oh, I was a thrower for years. Yeah. So my main thrust of work was throwing. Yeah, cut and reassembled. But throwing as well, it's so synonymous with function. Was it very obvious from the work that you were making that a function was... No. No. (laughs) They were more sculptural, I think, in that... Yes, there were vessels, but because they had been cut and reassembled, yeah, I mean, there were some bowls in there, but mostly they were more sculptural. But it was in the 80s, and uh, a bit of a recession here at that point. I wanted to travel. Ceramics was always going to be important to me, but how that could marry with this desire to travel, and that changed through the years, that sometimes I was able for those two things to coexist in places, and other times needs must. I was working in other areas, maintaining that interest in ceramics and visiting specific exhibitions or places. But it was never too far beneath the surface as to, you know, what I wanted to do. I'm such a homebody in that I really don't get the opportunity to travel much. I think it just seems like such an incredibly brave thing to do. Even as a very young woman, for you to travel the world, that sounds so romantic and really wonderful. Yeah. I remember in um, Denmark for a while, my flatmate had a ceramic factory there. So I I participated in that a little bit, but not significantly. But then I went to South America and I remember arriving in Lima on my own with very little of the language, thinking, what am I doing here? (laughs) (laughs) But I had a vague plan that uh, there was a... um, I'm trying to remember the names, but there was an aid project running in Cajamarca in the north of Peru, Ilambo. How I knew about this was because I had lived in Denmark, there was a friend of a friend that was working on this aid project, which was doing ceramics in the northern part of Peru. So I knew at some point that I would go along and I would join that for a bit. But actually, as things unfolded, I was there for about a year, but I ended up going south, not north. And uh, it took me nearly a year to get back to it. So um, I spent a couple of months there in the north and they were developing a kiln or kilns that were more sustainable because so much of the forest was being cut. A lot of the local farmers were losing land that was fertile enough to grow produce. So They were trying to reintroduce ceramics into an area that, uh, though there was a bit of a tradition of it, a lot of these farmers needed to find a new vocation, really, or work. So, But a lot of the problem had been that um, they had lost so much of the forest that they needed to introduce firing techniques that were more sustainable and could use the eucalyptus trees. And so I joined that for a little while. But yes, and visited I mean, all these amazing, amazing sites in South America, you know, the Nazca Lines, which again, keep coming back sometimes in some guises in my work and Machu Picchu and various archaeological sites. But equally, through the travels, I think just the areas of significant geological interest will still be there in the archives in my head somewhere that uh, I I feel they come through sometimes. Yeah. I then spent a bit of time travelling through the Sahara. Again, there are various geographical formations that exist within the Sahara. Again, they have resonance sometimes in some some work. That's amazing. I think the furthest... (laughs) It wasn't up until very recently, but the furthest I've probably (laughs) been was Wales. (laughs) Okay. Okay. That is just mind-blowing. I mean, even the cultures that you would have been exposed to, never mind the beautiful landscapes and so on as well. That's just... No, no, they are there. I mean, sometimes it feels like another life, time ago sort of yeah. thing. You do have to remind yourself. But um, I would often get lost in whatever I'm making and realise that, not necessarily immediately, but at some point that, oh, that's where that connection comes from. And it will be a site I've seen or something that I've experienced. Even travelling before Google Maps kind of blows my mind a wee bit, you know. <laughs> How you were able to get in communication between all of these different people and how did you, did you manage to stay in contact with your family or did you have friends that you could kind of communicate with to travel with? I still find that a wee bit. Yes. I was thinking about that the other day, actually. I mean, you'd have to queue for hours to make a phone call. From there I went and then I lived in Indonesia for six years. I remember just even trying to phone home. You'd come down the, down the mountain a bit and uh, there was a little telephone not kiosk, but a small shop that you'd have to queue and wait. And then you'd have to pay beforehand. You wouldn't get very long because it would just it wasn't even digital. It just they'd tell you which phone you could go to. <laughs> that should make you make your phone call. So it didn't happen very often. No. 
no mobile phones then. And, and uh, when I was in Indonesia, I was working, I was teaching English as a foreign language. But I also, in my own house, had a studio. At that point, was doing. I mean, locally, they would use. It wasn't. It wasn't earthenware, but it was a fairly robust day and wear and uh, I would do some pit firings and smoke firings and it was so humid after if I would make something there that if it didn't get fired then you'd come out a day or two later and it disintegrated on the shelf. <laughs> wow whenever you lived in these places was it did you see that okay that you're going to live there you know for the rest of your life or was it that you were trying to learn something from the places that you were in with an, a desire to bring it back to the UK or how did you kind of fit into your surrounding community I think that throughout my life I have lived for the moment I haven't forward planned a huge amount in my life to the detriment I think of um, some things but also there's plenty of things that wouldn't have happened in my life had I been a planner or somebody that had ambition to aim for something I went to Indonesia I didn't know I had a, an initial year contract with the work and I loved it so much I stayed stayed six years but as I said at that point Though I didn't know what I was going to do, I knew I wouldn't be teaching English as a foreign language forever. It was That was a means to an end. But I definitely wanted to get back to working in the ceramics again. I, from there, I came back here for a little while. And then I went out to Japan. In Japan, I had an opportunity of working with a potter. I had a residency there and made tea bowls. Again, that was another opportunity that allowed me again to put a portfolio together that I came back and I did my MA in Cardiff. That was then probably the pivotal point. I think also the point of recognition of, yes, I've really enjoyed the travel. I've met some wonderful, wonderful people. <laughs> I've had some fantastic experiences and seen lots of fantastic things, but wanting to come back and work in the ceramics again. Though, that, like I said before, that had taken largely a second place to the travel but had enabled me from time to time to do that specifically to work specifically in certain areas but um it was coming back to cardiff and um doing my ma it was a pivotal point there was a tutor there peak castles and i think i came back thinking oh i'm going to be making more tea bowls which i had become quite practiced at in japan but yeah he wouldn't let me near the wheel at all and pushed me towards sculpture now initially i resented that but but actually it was brilliant it was brilliant it was just pushing some of those ideas and not necessarily going back to what was familiar but to to push forward and explore other ways of making so i think that's probably where more of my sculptural pieces that's where i started exploring probably work that very strong resonance in in what i'm making now so it was at that point that i um went back to cambridge and these huge barns that my father has and all the tools and i started working specifically with tools that came from the barn that i would remember from my childhood i worked a lot with the dust and the rust and there was a bill hook so i think the first thing i worked with was a lot of the i did a lot of casting of the bill hook and things started casting in sand and uh, I was looking at the tools and then not only as their shape and their history with me, um, but also the techniques perhaps that were used to manufacture them in the first place and trans started translating that across to clay. And some of those would have been traditional techniques and others were kind of a, a melding of things that I was trying myself. I'm not saying I'm the only one that has done that, but that was new to me, I, I you know, or just trying things out and, and this whole area of sand casting was something that I then started to develop there. I also, at that point, my grandmother, she had died. There was an awful lot of her belongings that were about, and that was where I started working with the Singer sewing machine. And my final show was a selection of seven that had been made in different techniques, some that were looking as if they were cocooned through lots of thread and others that were cast and others that were similar to the, the piece now that I made when I, about five years ago, which was made up of layers as if it was layers of fabric. So yes, and then I, after my MA, I came here and did a little bit of teaching in the Ulster University there. And at that point I was exhibiting. We had a couple of exhibitions in London and here. And then I had Dan. And it was just very difficult juggling parenthood and being an artist and exhibitions and teaching and finances and it was just very hard juggling all of that and decided that I would focus on my family for a few years and it really wasn't until 2015 where I suppose I'd lost my confidence a lot at that point I suppose 
a lot of people that have focused on their family for a number of years or done something completely different for quite a few years, you lose your confidence and you just don't know how important it is or whether it's something you want to go back to or not. But it was definitely, I wanted to go back to it, but I, I really didn't know that I, you know, I just wondered if those skills had just left me. <laughs> I just, I, I felt a bit of a phony, really. I didn't know that I was capable of making any more. <laughs> so I was given an opportunity to go to have some time in a friend's studio and they worked primarily with porcelain. So uh, I knew that then, you know, I, I'm such a messy worker that if I bought anything else in, I would contaminate everything. So I um, started making purely with porcelain. And though I had made with porcelain way back in Nurian Mooncraft in, in the 80s, I hadn't really worked with it since, not purely, so it was it was new, really. And that coincided also of having seen an exhibition of Ursula Burke in um, Effie McWilliams. I can't remember what the name of the exhibition was, but there was a, a couple of her pieces there, balaclava bust and a couple of her heads. And they were specifically parry and porcelain. And I saw that and I just thought, what is that material? I must start working with that. And that was the beginning. <laughs> of, of uh, my relationship with power and porcelain and probably the result of all the work that's come in the last five years. You have just this ability to pick up these techniques I mean between on the wheel and then you know making your tea bowls and even for your masters as well with the sand casting and uh, Egyptian fire. Yeah yeah it was Egyptian paste sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes no, I worked with that an awful lot in my MA there yeah. Yeah, uh, and sometimes a lot with raw, just unfired. Uh, yeah, raw. I remember seeing some pieces in tanks and degrading as well, and that seemed like a, a bit of a thing of the pieces just over time, you know, eating away, and you weren't really afraid of having this ruggedness to the pieces as well. I mean, they're very different from what you're making at the moment, especially because they're in that contrasting material of porcelain, but you can really see that, that energy within them, and it's really, it's beautiful, it's really lovely. Yeah, there's that aspect of my work where, I mean, I have this wide palette of techniques. I won't pigeonhole myself into technique. It's just like a palette that are constantly evolving. The sculptural pieces that are the objects that have some connection with my childhood, the sewing machine and the, um, the telephone and the typewriter and the pieces you were talking about with the microscopes. I will look at the object. It's almost like there's a narrative to them of their connection to me. But also I will look at the object and the sewing machine needed to be in layers of fabric or, or something that resembled that. Or the microscopes that we were talking about there that were made after my MA there, that they had a connection to Cambridge and the science of, in Cambridge because I had a, a res oh, I've missed that bit, but I had a residency in Wising Arts and Cambridge being an area of science. And of course, I grew up there and I wanted to create almost a micro macro type of environment. And I had a lot of so I made microscopes that were unfired, but that grew fungus basically in these tanks and then started to disintegrate through the condensation that was produced. And the Egyptian paste looked very much like archaeology, sea archaeology, uh, things that were under the, under the sea and that they would have corals and various things growing on them. So um, it was, again, because the microscopes had something to do with science and looking at things through the microscopes and organic life. That's why they looked very much the shapes of microscopes, but very looked very organic. Whereas the um, telephone, I wanted something that spoke of communication and I had tried lots of different techniques and in the end settled on what they call slice form, which is the, the warp and the weft and the communication between them. But I, I definitely wanted something that spoke of the handmade and the fallibility of the handmade and a uh, connection between the analogue and digital. There were lots of layers of things in that and the same in the typewriter, you know, wanting something that had lots and lots of layers of what would be paper. So, yes, those those air, that area of work, I take an object and do an awful lot of research, not reading research necessarily, research into the material and techniques that would have a narrative with the piece. And that's ongoing. And it's through those pieces that I might spend six months to a year developing a technique that enables me to make the piece. And from there, other work will develop. Even looking at the likes of your 
telephone and the typewriter and your sewing machine and these processes of that layering what was it that you called it the slice for the um, telephone it's slice forms yeah, slice with... forms goodness me it's even come up with the idea to create that in porcelain sheets like that that's insane <laughs> well, no, i true. mean if, if i talk a little bit about the development of that it was it yeah wasn't much i had the telephone the telephone was a telephone we had mm -hmm. not not the exact telephone but it is a telephone that's similar to the piece the, the telephone we had in, in my childhood home and that was important so there were various ones i did go around various antique shops until I found the phone that, that uh, there were some very nice looking phones but it wasn't it wasn't a specific phone that I that I needed and wanted and then I tried lots of different techniques I knew I needed some, I wanted something that was pixelated but said something about analog and digital communication the fact that it's so immobile whereas now we're so used to things being you know <laughs> uh, the fact it had to be fixed <laughs> <laughs> and couldn't move there was all sorts of things but I mean it was uh, and I tried lots and lots of different techniques until I landed on slice forming and, and then purely by hand cutting all those sheets by templates with uh, cardboard which I still have and also the warp and the weft so you look at some again I was looking at uh, different weaving techniques and ikat double ikat which happens in, which is in Indonesia and it means that the warp and the weft are dyed and then when they're woven together, a pattern is formed and a very strict pattern. But but because the vagaries of it actually lining up, you'd get that kind of blurring around the edges. And that was important to me as well. I don't you know, I didn't want something that was that precise. Otherwise, I could it perhaps could have been 3D printed, something similar. But uh, that element of making it by hand and the fallibility of that, there's lots of bits broken in it, but it hangs together and you still recognize it as a as a telephone a lot of people would agree that ceramicists potters they're very patient people anyway because of the medium but would you say that you're quite a patient person even the way in the processes and the things that you make they just seem to scream patience just because of their construction there's a long pregnant pause there because I think most people close to me would say uh, patience isn't one of my virtues. No. <laughs> Not known for it, though. No. But having said that, there's a challenge. Yeah. When you're when you're working with some of these techniques, they do demand patience. So it is there in my repertoire somewhere to try and try again. But I think that's ceramics, isn't it? You, you get knocked back and you pick yourself back up again and have another go and have another go. But it's mm -hmm. also that aspect that comes into the work because that fallibility of the handmade is very important in the work. I, I don't want pure facsimiles of anything. That work of the hand is very important, as is all the, as are all mistakes. Maybe that's just an excuse. <laughs> I look at my pieces and it tells me about all my mistakes, but they are part of it. They're part of that history. They're part of that. I suppose the fact that there's an awful lot of things like geology and archaeology that is in my work that digging down and the fact that things are broken and the fragments and time so I have some very big pieces that are drying out in the studio at the moment and I'm just loving the way that they're cracking they might go too far that at the end of it you don't have anything but I keep most of my broken bits much to the disgust of the person who shares the studio because they <laughs> but, but um though they get used again or they spark another idea yeah what surrounds me in the studio are my sketchbooks really and they are mostly of pieces that have failed if you would say it that way but they are still interesting they're still of interest of shape or texture or i can't say material material yes the material or the process they are there as my sketchbooks and reminders it blows my mind to think that uh you only sort of got back into ceramics about five years ago because mm. the products just seem so well considered and developed that the idea that they were pretty new is really just I would never have expected that were the products something that you had taken a long time to develop or was it just did it come really easily to you to develop those products no nothing came easily I had literally forgotten how to work with clay but Felicity the lady who owns the studio and that, that I work in the studio and that's where she had 
done a lot of her work. She was working, does still work with a lot of paper clay and and makes very thin sheets. She's got a big installation in Prony. And well, I had used similar sort of techniques in the first sewing machine that I had made. But I suppose I, with my material, which is very different to the porcelain that she's working with, yeah, tried out some of those techniques. And I also wanted some, not pattern, but let's say with the vessels, I, I didn't want plain white porcelain vessels. Perhaps this is taking me back to those times that I print. I don't do many drawings, but I, I enjoy that print technique, albeit through casting, leaving a record or traces or taking something away where it's absent. So I tried to bring some of that print technique into the porcelain. And that's how some of those marks came onto very thin sheets of porcelain. And I tried to make them into 3D shape and, and that's where all the cutting and the pattern making started to come back in. So no, they're not new. They weren't considered. They were just bringing in a wealth of experience from all my life. <laughs> just bringing it to, together, really. Yeah. Doing this when I was 15 or doing this when I was 20. And it's, it's not too different. You're honing those ideas. And I rotate I think fundamentally my practice is where through having made these big sculptural pieces that can take a year or two years from the very beginning of thinking about them to fruition, because they are big, complicated pieces with new techniques, they add to that palette of four or five techniques that I have that I keep rotating around. And each time you meet them, it's like you're not meeting them afresh, but because you're not working with them all the time, you come back to them, they kind of gather momentum that they work together or there's something that you've learned on an earlier piece doing something completely different that you then bring back to that technique. Whenever then you were honing up all of these ideas of what to make when you were going to start making again was it very obvious from the start that you were going to make a product range? No I wanted just to answer that question as to how important ceramics was for me. That was fundamentally, and that probably gave me a freedom because I didn't have an end idea. I just needed to get back into the studio and answer that question. Was this an area that I particularly wanted to move forward with in my life or was it an area that I, I was just going to put to one side? That therein gave me a, a complete freedom to make what I wanted. I didn't have an agenda at all. And the first piece I made was the telephone. It sounds as if I went straight into the studio and made that piece. I didn't. It took a year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and a year of playing with porcelain and trying new things. And when that piece it got into the RUA that year, that kind of gave me the confidence to think, OK, perhaps this is an area you could work at again. But I also knew that I was going to have to develop to make that financially feasible. I was going to have to go back to making some vessels and I did I threw I threw some vessels but at the same time because I had been making these thin sheets for the telephone that had kind of developed to a stage that I knew that I could make some vessels using that technique but as I said before I didn't want them plain. Whenever you're throwing I'm guessing you're not getting it as fine as you are when you're rolling the sheets but is there a similar language do you think in your thrown vessels as there are in your rolled out sheets? I don't throw very much at all at the moment. I did when when I started back five years ago. I went back to making bowls, actually two bowls, but just as another technique I was doing. But no, I think at that point I had spent so long making these thin sheets for the telephone that I, I knew that that was an area I wanted to push and explore. But when I was in Japan there for a couple of years, I had learned an awful lot of calligraphy. I struggled with that language, but I did learn a lot of the kanji. And I realised that actually a lot of those strokes and that mark making came through and still continues to come through on some of the vessels. And one aspect of your work that doesn't necessarily seem to be as obvious is glazing. I don't glaze. Yeah, no. I have no interest in glaze. And that's not to say I will never have any interest in glaze. I like the pieces to have an integral part. I don't like applying. And it's the same with the bowls. None of the, that mark making is applied to the surface. It is an integral part of the piece. And other than for function, glazing the insides of those pieces with a clear glaze, I rarely use glazes. 
I will use coloured clays an awful lot, but not glazes. But that's not to say, you know, if I'm making a piece that calls for it to be glazed, I would explore that area. But it's not it's not somewhere something I have a particular interest in. No. As a non ceramicist, does that mean you have to fire it less or do you still have to fire it whether it does have a glaze or not? Mm, you know, the things with all my pieces is that I fire them many times. And also, if they've warped, I quite like some of those natural happenstances that happen in the kiln. Not always, but uh, but need be, I will take it back to the kiln six, seven, eight times more if need be. The bowls, not so much. They will take three or four times, depending. But yeah. What would be the reason that you would need so many firings? Again, as a non-ceramicist, I thought you needed to do a bisque firing and then a, like a glazed firing. And then if the glaze hadn't worked, you could do a, a second firing. What is the benefit for you of doing it? You know, maybe eight times, because I'm sure, especially because your work's so fine, that that's maybe a, a bit of a danger, I would imagine, putting in so many times. Uh, no, I think it, it adds other layers to the work. But I, I must say initially, yes, it was very much that you had the two or three firings. But I think now I use the firing as a tool of actually, I like it is another layer to the work where I have used the firing and the heat to create some distortion or collapse or fusing of the work especially the sculptural pieces. Given some of the big, heavy, solid pieces of my sculptural work, they demand a very, 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 very slow firing and multiple firings. And if something explodes, I put it back together again and put it back in again. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> yeah, often the pieces go far too, you know, it's too far, in which case they, they sit on my shelves as a reminder. But oh, so often I will pick up a piece from four or five years ago and it will be integrated into a piece now. You discussed in one of the projects in South America that you were looking at the ideas of sustainability. Is that an important part of your practice just if you're saying that you're holding on to these pieces is it you know so there is less waste or is it that it just was really interesting and I just find it hard to throw things away I'm a bit like my dad if he were to go into the barns of our of our farm and just see not only his but his grandfather's layers and layers and layers of tools and I would you know that's how I work I, I don't think it's sustainable it's not sustainability that has driven me to do that, no. It is the fact that so often the residue of something is, is very interesting. And I think that even goes back to when I was exploring pieces that had some trace and you were actually working with the dust and the rust that came off those pieces. They say something of the work of themselves. So yes, I, that keep them. But sustainability, I, it's, it's coming more to the fore because it's all this recycling at the moment. So, so I... I, I do have to become a bit more sustainable practice. You know, a lot of some of the techniques I use can be very, they're not wasteful other than they create an awful lot of recycling. So I, I, I am going to have to become a little bit more sustainable in that context. So not so long after you took up ceramics again, it was two years afterwards, you were awarded the Rosie James Memorial Trust Award from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. That's right, yes. Yes, you shared that with Brian McKee, was it? That's right, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, no, it was terrific, absolutely terrific to get that opportunity again. I suppose having made the um, telephone and then deciding that this was what I was going to go back into working, that I had really focused on developing that range of vessels. And the Rosie Janes gave me an opportunity to step back and actually do another piece, the um, typewriter, which again took nearly the year to develop, I think, in as far as how to do it, how to make I wanted to enlarge the work, but at the same time that created solid pieces of porcelain, which in themselves generally would explode in the kiln. So I again needed to research that a lot. And through the research of that, that's where an awful lot of the core pieces came, all the solid pieces, most a lot of the solid work that I'm doing now through the research in how to fire the porcelain, that it was solid. And I quite like working with it solid because it has some resonance of the porcelain itself it being parian porcelain it's named after the pharos islands the marble of pharos in, in greece and uh, when it's solid you get that very much that marble like quality of it and i haven't tired at all i love the material and work with its translucency when really thin and then this lovely satin marble like quality when it's solid yeah it is still it's still the only material i work with I knew that with the typewriter, it was in my head for a few years. I knew I was going to need some help digitally with it. 
not that it's digitally made, but I needed that technology to help me map it. Yeah, to give me a street plan, really, of the layers. <laughs> and I'm a real technophobe, and it's just an area that I needed help with. In hindsight, I would have liked to have developed it myself because it's just another tool. I kick myself that I'm not able to work with it because it, it would be another tool that would help my practice, but it's just an error. I, have, I, I do not have the patience with working with technology that way. You have to feel that out and accept the help or the expertise from others to assist in seeing an idea develop. What about your actual making space? Could you talk us through what your studio space is like? It's, it's large. It's large. I'm very, very fortunate. There is an area that a lot of the moulds and the making will happen. There is also an area where there are the kilns, the kiln room, and a lot of the large pieces will dry in there. And then there's an area that I just have a lot of finished work, but work that I, as I said before, that form part of my sketchbooks. Often I just move the shelves around and then new connections are formed and new ideas. Also, it is given the studio, but I, there are certain things that I can only make certain times of the year. Given that with the incredibly thin sheets, I can't really make those in the summer. It all dries out too quickly and becomes unmanageable. You can, but it's frustrating. A lot of the solid work will happen <laughs> during those summer months. And then I also use cyanotype, which is one of the earliest print techniques, which um, you use the sunlight or UV light to develop. And again, that's going to happen more in the summertime, <laughs> given the climate here. So, yeah, I move around some of these techniques and areas of work throughout the year. And also, given the studio as to where in the back, if it gets far too warm, there are just certain things I can't make certain times of the year there. And is it still the studio space in Carrie Duff, is it? Seamfield? Yep. Yeah, it is a beautiful space. I have been and it is gorgeous. Lovely big windows, loads of space. I'm very jealous. The light <laughs> and the light. The yes. light is special. Yes, it's a very got a lovely ambience to it. And I love going there. My dog accompanies me every day. It's more of a distraction these days. Than I probably got a lot more work done prior to her coming back, you know, uh, getting her a year ago. But she's starting to settle down. Is she a good studio dog? We've often spoken about studio dogs before on different episodes. I mean, is Freya oh. a very good dog for you? Well, she's only a year and a half. She demanded a lot of, and still demands a lot of walking. So wasn't very tolerant of spending time where the focus wasn't on herself in the studio so she has not been a very good studio dog in that regard she's starting to settle but there are certain things that I can't do she's quite flighty for example if one of the machines goes on it will be nearly a week before I can get her to come back in again oh <laughs> I have to work around Freya a lot at the moment so, so. But it's getting better. It's getting better. No, she's a delight to have, but she is getting slightly more patient and knowing when to chill out a little. Brilliant. You have a long list of opportunities that you have taken part in, but one of the most recent ones is that you were selected for the Korean International Ceramic Biennale. Is that right? Yes, but that prior to COVID, that got hit by swine flu at the end of last year. Oh, wow. It's all on their website, but that's a day or two prior to it opening and suddenly everything had to close down and they managed to reopen and then had to close again for COVID. So that was hit badly by various viruses. So that didn't go as it planned as so many events <laughs> these days. You know, though a lot of artists had got their work out there, it went online. But yeah, that was it's nice to get selected for the online, be an online participant. Of that and I'm sure that even posting your work as well is just impossible sometimes yeah there are certain certain pieces well also it's the expense so that dictates really I suppose that there are certain things you don't apply for knowing full well that actually you couldn't afford to send them or whether they would actually make it I'm going quite good about packing but there was a piece that went a couple of months ago to Changchung Ceramics Festival in China. They paid for the carriage, so that could be very well packed, and that arrived that arrived intact. Another piece, due to COVID, didn't get to China and Beijing, so they're going to do that exhibition online. Work that was 
potentially going to collect next year. Again, not sure if that's going ahead or not. There's a piece in the RUA at the moment, which is part of the last project, which is about gravity and balance in relation to this time that we live in now. And um, that fortunately did get set up in the Elster Museum, but it opened one day and that then had to be closed. That will be closed for four weeks, hopefully it'll open to the public again but we don't know really. How do you feel about having work online and you know obviously if you go to the levels of making it so well and making sure that it is as perfect as your work is how do you feel people experiencing that work through photography or you know whenever you view photographs of other ceramicists do you feel there's a definite difference in how that is received? I can't remember who said, but two or three years ago, there was a talk I went to. The lady talked about, at that point, she was talking about the quality of photographs when applying to galleries and how important that was. This was before this time where everything's online. I think that that aspect of the photography has to be very, very good. I don't think anything can replace actually seeing the work walking around it, touching it. But given that some of my work can't travel very easily or get to places, I think I have to invest in that photography aspect of it. Myself learning how best to, I'm not a photographer, but how to best take photographs of work to get that quality across. Fortunately, Felicity takes good photographs as do, do friends of hers and views various people for photography. But again, it's an expensive aspect of it. But I think particularly at the moment, Photography is very important. How are you finding the whole COVID situation? Obviously, it's kind of taken off a lot of people by surprise. In your first lockdown, or now as we're, we're talking, it's the second lockdown, have you felt many changes or have you had to change anything as a result of restrictions coming in and things like that? It has created huge challenges. Initially, unfortunately, Ceramic London got having been accepted there this year, and fortunately, Due to the quality of the photographs, my work had been used for the publicity for that, which was great, a great opportunity. A lot of uh, money had been invested in that, but it had to be cancelled at the last minute. So that was a huge blow right at the beginning in March. And that, especially when you've worked towards something, it doesn't matter whether it's gone ahead or not, but when you've worked for something like that for so long, even if it had happened, there's that lull <laughs> afterwards but yes it was very hard to get motivated to go into the studio especially with everything being locked down having to reassess where what outlets or which ways were going to be more successful in getting your work to either exhibition or to the shops and galleries and which ones were going to be open that still is an ongoing area or more of it's perhaps going online and potentially some things might go online for myself through the website in the future depending how long this goes on but you have to to be sustainable in this time i have been fortunate in being having got some grants which has have allowed me to still work at some projects given that my work had been used for the publicity for ceramic london i was fortunate that a few buyers contacted me which was good enabling me to sell a bit of work through that through direct contact with buyers. Yes, it's a difficult time for all artists. It's a challenge. And so then being the busy person that you are, how do you manage to unwind? You were saying that whenever you had kind of taken a break from ceramics, you know, it was a nice way to sort of find yourself again. Other than ceramics, what else would you do to sort of relax? I walk a lot with my dog every day. That's a very, and even more so at this particular time, walk daily through the forest is a fundamental part of my day. I used to, I suppose, a year and a half ago before Freya came, spend more time in the studio. That's been, is limited through COVID and Freya's tolerance <laughs> to a few hours each day. But yeah, those walks are, are important. Towards the end of each episode, we tend to ask, what was the last piece of locally made crafts that you've bought or have supported? It would just be artwork, I think, probably. Yeah, having got a dog now that that tide line in my house the same with having kids suddenly <laughs> had, to, had to go <laughs> and still you know she loops about an awful lot so I have invested in wall art I mean I have there's a local artist Cara Gordon and I have got a piece from her and Esther Brimage so they are probably the 
Oh, and Alaco Day. They are pieces that are on my wall. Cara, Cara Gordon is the, I bought a piece of hers recently. Love her work. Love her work. Oh, no, even I don't even have wall pieces because Cooper, my dog, when he shakes, his drill just flies up. <laughs> and, you know, you need to step back and step away yeah. or you'll get hit. Yeah. No, I, my house is too small. To, you know, I wish uh, you know, it'd be lovely in, in my dreams. <laughs> or had I started my life with some ambition that I, I knew that's where I was going, <laughs> I think I perhaps could now have a house that would allow me to have sculptural pieces about, but I don't. It's too small. I collect a lot of rocks as I go along. Yeah. But it, artwork, I, it would be it would be for the walls that I, that I buy. Yeah. If people wanted to get in touch with you or find out more information about your work, how could they go about that? My website would have a lot of the photographs of the work on both the wall pieces, the, the vessels and more sculptural pieces. And uh, my email address is on there and people are more than welcome to contact me. At some point in the future, as I said, I may, may sell a few pieces of, of the vessels online, but that is an ongoing project at this time. It involves technology. so. so. <laughs> I really envy Robin because she can put stuff into like an envelope and post it. Whereas I was posting something there the other day. I'm making these little figgy pudding bobbles. It's like Russian dolls. I have to put it in a box and in a box and in a box. Yeah, yeah. And, in a, and by the time I'm finished, it's this size, but the bobble yeah. is tight, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. I'm really jealous that you can just put something in, a, in an envelope and post it for like, what? How, how much is a stamp, you know? <laughs> the postage I'm paying. Yeah. <laughs> That's awful. First <laughs> no, I know. I'm aware it's pretty disgusting. I am aware of that. <laughs> I, don't, I think also just that whole, I had to start thinking of, you know, where people are doing paintings and they have to pay quite a lot to the framer to frame a piece up. Well, that's what packaging is like for us, I think, yeah, when yeah, they've yeah. got pieces that can't just nip into an envelope. You know, that it, <laughs> it is a day that has to be invested into packaging or yeah, yeah. it's a whole area that has to be invested in. No. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> well, like this has been an absolutely amazing conversation. Thank you so much for sharing about your whole making experience. It's really wonderful to learn Brilliant. so much more about you. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for hearing it <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fine. What a wonderful conversation. And thank you so much for sharing your making story with us. It was a pleasure to speak with you. So that's the end of our second series. Both Gemma and I have had the best time doing this project, especially this time around as it meant so much to speak with all of our guests. While we would have preferred to visit our guests in their studio, it just wasn't possible this time. So we can't thank them enough for giving us the opportunity to share as it meant so much to stay connected this year. We are also incredibly grateful to all of you. We began this project last year as a fun way to share our passion about supporting local makers. So we are completely blown away by all of your support and encouragement for each episode. It really kept us going that you were as enthusiastic as us to hear about the amazing making stories that are local to us. And we can't thank the Arts Council of Northern Ireland enough for their financial support that we received back in June this year from their Artist Emergency Programme, which enabled us to speak to 10 fantastic makers. Their funding was not only a wonderful financial support, but a great confidence boost for both of us and this project. So what's next? Well, we have an amazing collaboration coming up with ACJ SNI, which we cannot wait to share more details about soon. So thank you again. We hope you've enjoyed listening to these conversations as much as we've enjoyed making them. 